Uh, good morning from London. Uh, welcome to the latest campaign in Candid Conversation. Uh, my name is Martin Redmayne, your moderator, and uh, good afternoon to those in Hong Kong and Bangkok. Uh, welcome to our international webinar on the subject of Asia. Obviously, if you all think about this, this is a, a very topical marketplace. Uh, let's call it the origin of the crisis, but also a massive opportunity that we have to really look at for the future. Um, according to Bo uh, Bloomberg's Wealth Index, uh, Asia is going to become a, a phenomenal marketplace with uh, the highest climbing number of billionaires in the world. Um, the next four or five years, they expect to grow by 27%, which is quite an exciting number uh, to consider. Um, what we're also looking at is the fact that Asia in the future, and the Pacific as well, will be a hotspot. By that I mean there's things happening around the world next year, the Olympics in Tokyo, the America's Cup in Auckland, both of which I think will put the Asia-Pacific region on the map and draw a lot of yachting attention. Um, so I think we have to look at that very closely as to what we can do to prepare and what people are doing to prepare. Um, other things that are very interesting, uh, there was a story we did on the migration report um, on the Pacific looking at the distance between Brisbane and Tokyo. It's only 4,000 miles compared to the distance between Monaco and Florida, uh, 4,500. So we have to put into context the actual cruising potential, the distances, the number of opportunities, the countries with the most incredible cruising grounds. We're going to talk to Dominique from uh, owner of Sailing Yacht La Mima. Indonesia, it's the most incredible place for private yachts, obviously. The charter market is a totally different subject. Um, Philippines, Vietnam, the Hong Kong region, all these things will be part of this conversation today. Um, so I'm very excited to talk to my uh, esteemed guests from Hong Kong and from Bangkok. First of all, I'm going to bring into the conversation uh, Mr. Kenneth Lung, one of the um, vice president of the Lysun Group, um, and has plenty of experience either uh, cruising and thinking about the world of yachting, the world of hospitality, the world of wealth and property development within the Asian region. Um, Kenneth, uh, join me on the screen, please, and uh, I look forward to chatting to you about what's happening in Hong Kong. You're live from your boat in Aberdeen. Uh, let's have a chat with Kenneth. There you are, Kenneth. Good morning. Kenneth and Michael, how are you this morning? Very good. Good morning. You good morning. can hear us. Hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Very good. So uh, we are reporting live from uh, Aberdeen Marina Club in Hong Kong. Um, we want to come down here to uh, show our viewers a little bit of the uh, action in Hong Kong. Uh, it's uh, Wednesday. Uh, on a weekend, I can uh, tell our, uh, our friends that uh, most of the boats behind me would be all gone, out um, cruising with uh, families and so on and owners. Um, just a quick background uh, of uh, what's going on since the start of the COVID-19. Um, the government imposed travel restriction, uh, social distancing, a uh, lot of, uh, I think, uh, families and uh, children who used to be able to travel around uh, Asia for vacation uh, uh, became stuck in Hong Kong. Uh, the, uh, some of the very limited uh, recreation that uh, they can take on to uh, is to get on their boats, their yachts, uh, sailing boats, and so on, and uh, and go to the beautiful base in Hong Kong and spend a weekend and sometimes overnight. Now, um, I think the uh, people may uh, wonder what's going on with uh, Hong Kong in general. Um, I can tell uh, friends that uh, the stock market uh, has not uh, experienced a cat catastrophic collapse. The wealth, I would say, uh, has uh, remained pretty much intact. Um, apartment prices, house prices, uh, commercial property prices have not dropped significantly. I don't think that fee people are feeling the pain, especially people who can afford the beautiful yachts uh, like those behind me uh, and those beautiful apartments, as you can see uh, behind my head there. And those are some of the more luxury uh, sea view apartments in Hong Kong. So all in all, I believe the the spending power uh, is still there, and I this is uh, based on what Michael tells me on a on a on a regular basis that uh, he is still receiving a lot of uh, um, inquiries from from uh, people interested in upgrading, moving up. 
I think that is part of the phen phenomenon. Uh, Martin and I talked about some time ago that uh, because people are spending more time uh, on the weekends with the kids, friends on the yacht, they find that the, the space is uh, perhaps not enough to host such a such a you know number of people. Uh, so there's been some trend that we're seeing that people are looking to inquire whether there there are boats available for upgrades. So uh, I think the the condition in Hong Kong now is slightly improving. Uh, the lockdown is working. The government is starting to relax some of the measures. Uh, people are starting to go out a little bit more. And I think uh, all in all, the signs are pointing to a rather uh, uh, positive development, at least in this part of the world. And so um, we hope that uh, the low number of um, cases in Hong Kong can continue so that the um, economy, the business, and the activities can uh, slowly get back to normal. So uh, basically, I think that is a quick overview of what's going on in Hong Kong right now, Martin. And let me, let me ask you a question very quickly, Kenneth. In terms of the way in which you're seeing clients or owners within the region use their yachts, what has changed since the crisis arrived? Because we talked about uh, things like gyms and health club facilities and other things, which are the typical ways of relaxation in the region. I'm just like, what has dynamically changed in the, in the yachting space? Right. So you are correct. Uh, I think I, we talked about uh, the uh, lockdown situation uh, where a lot of the um, clubs like the uh, Aberdeen Marina Club where we're in, the indoor facilities uh, were closed. Uh, a lot of the luxury apartments, uh, private uh, clubs with the swimming pool, gyms and so on are also closed uh, because the government want people to maintain social distancing. Yeah. Although those uh, slightly st uh, started to uh, be relaxed somewhat, I think people in general are still apprehensive about uh, the uh, getting sort of in an environment where they don't know the people too well. And in that respect, they seem to uh, continue to flock to their, to their beautiful yachts and get out onto, uh, onto the water on the weekend so that they could minimize the amount of interaction they may have with uh, strangers. So a part of the extension of the, I think, the social distancing behavior, I would say. Yeah, so I think what's interesting in terms of um, the use of yachts, what I think is, from my interpretation, also understanding, there's, there's people who are now using their yachts for more than just a day trip. They're actually starting to stay on board for longer and actually use yachts like a traditional sort of weekend escape, if you like, and stay on board, and which is fairly atypical in some cases. Is that correct? Yes, I think... Uh, Perhaps uh, Bart can uh, elaborate late, uh, more later on, but from my observation is that the uh, owners of uh, yachts in Hong Kong, traditionally they use the yachts for day trips. Yeah. But uh, because of COVID-19, I've actually seen firsthand some of the owners who stay in a beautiful bay for months on end and only send the chase boat uh, back to town to pick up, I think, uh, provisions and groceries. And the person on board, uh, needed to swim every day and he was locked out of his own uh, apartment gym and therefore he just used the beautiful bay as uh, his uh, workout uh, uh, ground and, and uh, I think he, I understand that he enjoyed the uh, overnight uh, experience very much where I don't believe he's ever done before. Uh, yeah. He somehow has attracted a couple of his friends, yacht owners, to join him on weekends. And I've never seen so many yachts overnighting in uh, in one of the beautiful bays in Hong Kong near the club. Uh, yeah. At least 40, 50 yachts on on a uh, Saturday night. Uh, that's quite an amazing uh, uh, development, I would say. Yeah, it's a shift in the market. Babe. So what yes. I'm going to do now, I'm going to bring Bart into the conversation as well now, so we can have a chat with Bart, uh, who's in the office, I believe, in um, in Hong Kong. Bart, please join me. Yeah, I can hear you. There you go. There you are. Hi, Bart. Yes, hi. Yeah. Man, how are you? Thank you very much for uh, organizing this, and uh, pleasure to be on uh, your show. 
Um, very good, very good um, feelings from Hong Kong. We are easing out of the, uh, the lockdown um, slowly but surely. Uh, we had no cases for quite some time now, so we're all feeling uh, relatively safe and are looking forward to uh, a new life. Uh, it's been quite a time for everybody, I think, and my sympathy is with everybody who has suffered one way or the other. Uh, it's been like living in a prison a little bit. We're glad to go out. You can see the beaches in Hong Kong are incredibly full over the weekend. Social distancing uh, every now and then is forgotten and people are glad to be uh, out in the fresh air. You're very right. Um, the, the market has changed in Hong Kong in the way they were using boats. Uh, um, I also have been out on the water every weekend, I think, during this whole period. Uh, not so much um, for enjoyment only, but really to see how is the market reacting. Uh, and we've made quite a few friends, uh, people who normally don't use their boats for overnight, stay overnight, they come back every weekend, they bring other people on board. And, and generally, they really start focusing on enjoying a boat rather than just being there to play mahjong or to you know meet a few people and then go home again. Uh, so that's that's clearly significant, and we only hope that's going to stay. Yeah. And what are you learning from this in terms of the way Tampa Nicholson's operates at the moment? Anything that's changing there? Um, yeah, a lot. I think um, um, to the extent we weren't used to that, we're all uh, much more used to working from home and working um, on the go, basically, not so much from home. But the office has become far less of a focal point, and uh, we are working much more um, within the Kemper and Nicholson Group internationally. So it's it's far more integrated than we were ever before. Yeah. from an Asian point of view, and don't forget Asia is new in the Camper Nicholson group. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a big uh, change and that helps us um, advise people. It helps us to get information quicker to people who are asking it. And what we've learned really is that because people had time uh, to be on the internet, the people have, uh, our prospects and, and future clients have really had a lot of time to educate themselves what is available in the market. They've been able to talk to different brokers, different people. And so we can see that the, uh, the level of interest and the um, education, level of education is far higher than it was three months ago. Right. Uh, I can only learn from that that probably that will lead to a buying interest or a selling interest or a charter interest uh, as soon as we can travel again, because I think that is the biggest restriction now. Yeah. Uh, we, and we don't know. I mean, this is, one of the problems with this whole corona issue that the information uh, is really not very accurate and uh, we don't really know what is going to happen next. Uh, but we assume that travel will um, come back fairly quickly, at least in Southeast Asia, uh, which would mean that probably places like Phuket would open up again and uh, that would allow people to go out uh, a bit further afield. Interestingly, uh, Hong Kong has never really been a charter market. We've had some day charter business. Of course, we had the traditional fishing boat day charter business, but really luxury yacht charter has been uh, very limited. Not many boats um, around to, uh, to charter and usually more foreigners who come and visit and think, oh, let's go for a day on a boat or half a day, something like that. Now you can't get any boat, and uh, they're all out for charter. People take them out for weekends, three days, four day trips. Uh, so that has opened up an experience because these people never chartered before. All first time charters who now been on a boat for a weekend or three days with their children, they love it, and they've been going out for a hike or a dive or whatever. So I think again that um, has created a lot of interest in uh, in term charter. Yeah. So, so what are they doing with the boats? As you said, they're going hiking and what sort of activities are there? Are they typical med style charter activities or is it a totally different marketplace? How do we communicate that? Well, I haven't been on all the, we don't have much of the charter uh, fleet here in uh, Hong Kong and uh, we don't do much charter activities because it tends to be mainly day charter. But what I've learned in the last uh, weeks about the charter business here, that it's mainly people with children, obviously, because they're at home and yeah. they have to take them out and therefore a boat is a good means to, uh, to go uh, and take your family out of the, the house. 
Um, because it's with children, you have to keep children busy. So, you know, you see all the boats, pedal boards go over the side, they're pedal boarding, they're snorkeling, they're diving. Uh, in Hong Kong, we have beautiful trails um, almost in any anchorage, so it's very easy to go ashore and then do a nice hike, uh, three, four, five, ten kilometers, whatever you want to do. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of combination um, of uh, land activity and staying on the boat. Yeah. We even had a group who took their bikes and went to a special bike trail and bike during the day and then had a big barbecue on the boat in the evening and got dropped off in Central. That kind of thing I've never seen before in Hong Kong. Uh, so that's really uh, very encouraging yes. for our charter fleets and their product. I think everybody's learning that we have to do something to, uh, to create that in an ongoing way. Also, I think a lot of these people are telling us you know, as soon as we can, we would like to travel to Phuket or Malaysia and do a week charter or do a holiday a bit longer than just a weekend. So that's going to fire up a market there as well, I think. So you're saying that the wider Southeast Asia market is going to get hotter as well based on this understanding of uh, how to use a boat? That's right. Learning uh, and, uh, and younger people. Mainly yeah. young people too. and children, you know, when you say let's go out on the boat, they say no. But once they're on a boat and they're pedal boards and they're stuff and there's a, a nice captain who takes them uh, or teaches them some something, you know, they're all keen and they're all there to, uh, to, to come back. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, I'm now going to uh, bring in Dominique as well. So stand by while I bring Dominique into the call. Uh, I'm going to leave the camera, so um, I'll see you in a second. Um, one second. Where's Dominique? So Dominique is the wonderful, luckiest man I know who has this superb La Mima that sits in Indonesia and does the most incredible cruising. Uh, Dominique, how are you this morning in Bangkok? I'm very well, thank you very much. Bangkok is very hot and the, the restriction are easing now, so it's getting better. Yeah. The flight are still restricted, especially the international flight. They unfortunately they postponed opening till end of June, so that's going to slow down a bit the activity. Uh, but in Indonesia, uh, in Indonesia things has been a bit uh, closed. I mean, I, I heard uh, Bart and uh, Kenneth telling they could take their boat any weekend in Indonesia. You couldn't; it was not allowed, and uh, any charter is still uh, prohibited till mid June in Rajampat and Komodo. But on the other hand, uh, they're talking about uh, reopening. I think by beginning of July, uh, everything will be will be reopened again, airport, charter, every, all the activity. So I hope, I hope it's gonna go that way. Because in any case, Indonesia need to reopen very quickly. Yeah, I, I think the question I have for you in, in two, two subjects is one is, where you are in Bangkok and Thailand and the general Southeast Asia sort of behavior at the moment is, is what has been happening recently in terms of cases and the attitude towards the virus. How are you feeling? Where? In Indonesia or in Thailand? But both. Well, in Thailand, they're very disciplined. They took the first, they took uh, all the steps right from the beginning. I think they handled the crisis very well. And even people are surprised why they don't open the international flight sooner than that. Indonesia is a bit different. Indonesia, uh, they react much slower. But I believe Indonesia, well, I believe the, the, the number talk by themselves, Indonesia is not so affected, maybe uh, uh, probably because of the heat, but it's not, if you remove Jakarta, it's not really so much affected. Okay, uh, so a lot of people want to reopen because of that. The, the, the way, the, way uh, the crisis was handled in Indonesia is totally different than Thailand because also they don't have the same health, health network, okay? Yes. So they were not ready at all. Thailand was ready. Thailand is very uh, advanced for the health. Uh, and also Indonesia is nearly 300 million people. So it's not it's with 17,000 islands. So yeah. you can imagine it's very hard to, uh, to manage, uh, hopefully with the heat, uh, that will help a lot and the country is less affected than the others. I was just checking the number. If you look at the uh, death per million, you don't have more uh, death per million in Indonesia than in Singapore, which has 
similar climate. Okay, so yeah. obviously Singapore a lot of testing, so they saw a lot. Indonesia didn't have a lot of testing, so there is much more infected people than the one I declared. But uh, the result, I mean, the damage are the same per million in both countries. Yeah. So how how have you and Lamima had to sort of rethink this year, and what's what's your strategy for coming out of this this crisis? So what we did now, because everything is closed in Indonesia, we did we did a lot of work, like to to uh, improve the aesthetic of the boat, to do maintenance, which uh, we could do in advance, you know, to be ready for for the next season. But what we find is uh, we have a lot of people itching to go to come on the boat. We have, I mean, this this week we have three inquiries, which yeah. I didn't expect, you know. So. Uh, I already have people asking me to uh, extend their charter, but during the Christmas New Year, we're already fully booked for, let's say, 10 of December till 20 of January. So we couldn't expand that, but we had the demand for that. Like people from America who's been stuck at home now, they really want to, they want to evade. And I think uh, Indonesia for that is fantastic uh, cruising ground because it's very remote, it's very wild, it's very natural and it's beautiful. So it's not the same charter than uh, the typical charter. It will be a very natural charter. It will be for it will be the same type of clientele than the people who go to Antarctica. You know, people who want to discover the wide side of the charter. Do you think that will be a shift in the mindset of clients to say, actually, I don't want to be with the crowds anymore. I want to go and discover yeah. and escape. I think so. I, even we had, just at the beginning of the pandemic, we had an inquiry for Russian people. They wanted to quarantine on the boat because they thought it was the only safe place to be on a boat in a remote area with nobody around. So that, that was a bit extreme. And the, the thing hasn't been through because, uh, anyway, the flight was was uh, prohibited at this time already. But people were thinking about that. I mean, it's like uh, Kenneth, when you say, like, uh, people go in uh, for the weekend, to be in a safe place on the boat, you know, and they can enjoy, they can be outside, they can feel, they feel protected because they are away from the crowd. So Indonesia in that matter have a lot to offer. I mean, you have uh, the big highlight like Komoro and Raja Ampat, but you have so much more. You have, I mean, Togan Island in Sulawesi, you have Forgotten Island, you have the Spice Island, you have the south of Papua where you can swim with a whale shark. You have a lot, a lot, and still a lot is, is to, to be discovered. So for people who want to now want space, you know, after this, uh, after this epidemic, who look for space, who look for purity, okay? Yeah. Yeah. I think Indonesia is great for that. Now, the, the, it's not a problem for me. It's a, it's a problem for, for you. <laughs> <laughs> the charter in Indonesia is not allowed for foreign flags, so that's a limitation, but it's allowed for Indonesian flag, and you have a few Indonesian boat ready for charter, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a different type of boat. There will be mainly Pinisi. Pinisi is a, is a typical Indonesian boat. Pinisi used to be cargo boat, uh, till, till the fifties. That was the main cargo boat. Now they've been slowly replaced by aluminum and steel boat, but it's still, you still have a lot of traditional Pinisi, traditional cargo boat. And they use the, we use this kind of boat to do charter. So basically, uh, you built like uh, the yacht version of a cargo boat. So it's it's very nice because you blend with the scenery. You know, you're on a wooden boat. You're on like a typical, like, it's, it's, it's a bit uh, inspired by the Dutch schooner from last century. So it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful product made in a traditional way on, on the beach in Sulawesi because this is the only place where you can build your boat. So basically you are on a very uh, natural yacht and obviously when you build your, your yacht, you're going to bring all the goodies of the modern comfort of, of, of the modern yacht. So you have the traditional look, but with all the comfort of the modern yachting. Yeah. And the other thing I want to I want to say is because it's Indonesian, you need to have Indonesian flag to a charter. You need to also have Indonesian crew. You don't need to take all your crew as Indonesian, but what we call the manning, the, the crew, the, who, which will man the boat, the engineer, all the officer, we need to be Indonesian. Yeah, I think I think I'm, which is I'm, great, which I'm, is great because it gives you another experience. You can blend, you can really meet the Indonesian people. Okay? Yeah, because sure. you live during your charter time, you live with 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 your crew. You know, yeah. they are already there. It's I mean, it's not like Porto Fino where you can go outside for. 
for dinner. No, no, you eat <laughs> breakfast, lunch and dinner on the boat. All the activities are related to the boat. You can do a few hiking, you can do a few uh, visits a few villages, but you will be 95% on the boat. And the Indonesian crew has a lot to offer, and that's maybe something people don't know enough. I mean, the Indonesian crew are so nice. Like, you have the warmth of the Asia, you have the hospitality, you have, I mean, you, this guy, they, I mean, I'm talking for the crew in Lamima, they love their boat, they're dedicated, and as much as our guests love the boat, I mean, the boat is great, okay, the, they love it. But the best compliment, Every time, 100% of the time, the best compliment we have is for the crew. And, you know, that's something uh, we need to promote more. Like, come and, come and do a charter in Asia. You're going to meet some Asian people, you know, like, not, not, not just when you visit the village, but on the crew, you know, on the boat. Okay. All right, Dominic, let me, I want a quick question I want to ask you from Maxime in Moscow. What about safety in Indonesia? How safe are we in Indonesia these days? Much more safe than Moscow, I will say, Maxime. <laughs> Save from Moscow. Interesting. Um, obviously, there's a few questions coming on the chat here, but I'm going to sort of quickly run into um, a general conversation point for all three of you I want to comment on. One is listen, the, the topic is have the Asian market or has the Asian market changed its attitude and appetite to yachting? So we, we said earlier on with Kenneth and Bart, yes, there's been a change in attitude in Hong Kong. But generally, what do you think is the is the future of Asia? Um, Bart, you've been there for a long, long time. Uh, Dominic, you've been there for eight, nine years. Is that right? Yeah, correct. And if you're a born and bred, so we all talk about the, the billionaire, the wealth in Asia. What is the future looking like in terms of the yachting landscape? And and what have we learned from this last year of shifting sands? Let's call it. Bart, do I go first? And thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, I think the I uh, think the uh, echo here. Should we do something? Uh, yes, there is a twenty-eight group. I think uh, we can see in Asia is a much younger group of people, affluent, coming from all countries out of Asia, China and Thailand, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Indonesia, and uh, and they're exploring. They're much more into uh, adventure holidays. They want to do things, and they are gradually beginning to uh, to also get an interest in uh, in yachting, and not only in motorboats, also in uh, catamarans, um, which in most cases still are sailing catamarans. Uh, and also into uh, sailing yachts as well. Uh, the sports are typically boarding, diving, uh, kite, kiting, uh, hiking, you name it. And all of that is, of course, uh, available. As Dominique says, these destinations are so, uh, so rich in, uh, in, in natural beauty, in natural resources, that you blend in with the yacht, with the toys, and you have a fantastic time. And I think that is being recognized. And this, if anything, this period has accelerated that. Martin. <laughs> oh, Martin. We love Martin. Oh my God. Yes, I, I'm here. Sorry. What, what I want to try and make sure, Kenneth, is we also understand this. This the crisis has got a massive economic impact. So, how do you think this will affect the Asian markets and the buyers' behaviour? Yes, the uh, the question uh, is indeed interesting. I think, as I as I was uh, saying earlier on, um, the financial market. Uh, where people generate a lot of the wealth from um, and also the real estate market um, have not been severely or as severely affected um, as anticipated and therefore um, I was um, estimating that the, uh, the, the wealth um, of at least Asian clients or Hong Kong clients uh, are not substantially uh, uh, diminished and I think it can be um, rather 
shown or demonstrated in some of the the, the recent uh, inquiries. I think that uh, my colleague, I think Bart Michael, received from their own clients that uh, the interest to upgrade. Now, if you don't mind breaking your rule, Martin, I'll just uh, shift the camera slightly. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the uh, my favorite. I don't know whether you can see it behind the uh, covered AB yacht. That yep. is a new uh, 110 Reaver, Dolce Vita. Right. Right. And I, I have to say that uh, it's the biggest uh, yacht uh, that can uh, get into this uh, marina because of the length restriction. It's not that I believe the owner doesn't want a bigger boat, but because the owner, the marina can only accommodate a maximum of about 33, 34 meters in length. Now, I understand the most recent uh, or latest development in Hong Kong is the conversion of the Discovery Bay Marina into a marina that can accommodate yachts up to 65 meters. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I would imagine that you will, as soon as the marina is finished, we will see owners bringing their 65 meters and fighting for a spot in that marina. Uh, the wealth is, is I, I think, uh, people who has the wealth have been able to maintain the wealth and people who wanted a bigger boat uh, in at least Hong Kong, Asia, will very likely uh, use their wealth to uh, upgrade and buy a bigger boat. The limit is the uh, is the birthing situation, which I think you know uh, perfectly well. Yeah, I think that that's the biggest question I've always had is how do we get the infrastructure? How do we get the facilities, the refit centers and the, the service center that will keep the yachts there for longer and, and feel comfortable and, and allow the crew good bases to operate from? Um, but what are your views on that in terms of what's, what's the barrier to that? Is it government or is it just a financial? Always the, the, the sticking point here in Asia, right? It's the infrastructure. But if you look at it now compared to when these discussions started 10 years ago, um, Hong Kong has a number of marinas that can accommodate large yachts. And there's also a number of typhoon shelters that can accommodate large yachts. So it's no longer such a um, sticky point. You can park it. And the other thing is in Asia, generally in Malaysia, Thailand, we have marinas. Most marinas accommodate large yachts. So in that sense, Singapore has marinas, not so much on the cruising ground, but uh, there are marinas and more and more marinas coming. The next thing is really the refit centers because the, the, the service for these larger yachts is complex and uh, most yards we have are commercial yards and they're not very suitable. So I think with more birth more bigger yachts the refit centers will also start to develop into uh, a higher level of quality and that will all support the growth that we should get but how do, how does australia play a role in this well the australia new zealand thing is extremely interesting because uh, australia has just opened its market to visiting super yachts and changed the regulations for the charter business so no doubt that market will will boom and uh, they also have fantastic facilities, marinas, refit, etc. But from uh, Southeast Asia, it's still a long way. And so what needs to happen next is that the, the region needs to be more integrated by events. And you mentioned already America's Cup and in Japan, the Olympics. I think if we get these events for larger super yachts, they actually, that allows them to make a two, three year plan into Asia, including, for example, a five-year refit that uh, may be necessary in that period. And, uh, and that will benefit us tremendously. And that wasn't there before when Australia still had very um, uh, tough restrictions on visiting yachts. And New Zealand now with the America's Cup, which they're probably going to win the first one, so there will be two America's Cup. There will be five, six years of a real nice destination uh, in the Asia Pacific. So I think all of that helps now to um, to develop the business in all sectors um, where it wasn't really happening before. Yeah, I think I think the question is, as you say about the distance, but actually when you look at Japan and everything in between as a looped cruising ground, including Indonesia, Thailand, etc., it's the most joined up 
long distance cruising you could ever imagine. Except one thing that people forget is we have weather and weather pattern. You know, there are um, half a year you cannot go to certain places, in the other half year you can. So you, like in the old days when the the ships sailed on the uh, monsoon to Asia or to the West, uh, the West Indies, and then they came back the next season, uh, and that's what is happening now too. You cannot just go to Asia and come back again the same year. That has happened with Phuket. Yeah. Just come out and then they go back again. But it's an incredibly expensive exercise for very little return. But if you can plan to come into Asia for two, three years, include a refit uh, in, that, uh, in that time frame, then it makes sense. And then owners can see Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and even the Pacific, and then on the way out, maybe to Alaska. Yeah. And I think that's the point. The Pacific is also another key part of this journey in terms of Fiji, Tahiti, and the various other Pacific islands. It, it becomes a dual season program that I still feel is, is not really, uh, let's say, qualified or clarified to the market enough because um, it, it's, it's a phenomenal opportunity. And, and going back to Kenneth's point, the, the wealth in Asia has been quite robust in the last few years and is still growing by the sound of things. So, Bart, what's the typical inquiry at the moment in terms of size of boat? Well, there's three markets. I would call it the uh, elite market, which is really the um, the very affluent um, people in, in Asia, in all countries in Asia, who um, are really looking at the new construction uh, um, uh, of yachts. And... Uh, there you, you, you go 60 meters plus 60 is the smallest. It goes all the way up to well over 100 meters. And Asians, I just looked at the Forbes list. In the first 50 billionaires, um, the number 50 still has 25 billion, I think. In that, about one third is US. But there are um, Chinese, about eight, and uh, Asians about I think 16 or 17 so you can see that in the very very high end of that billionaire list Asia is already a very significant uh, number so yes. plenty of people who can afford and I think you're already seeing that that uh, very wealthy mainland Chinese uh, Hong Kong Chinese Singaporeans uh, Thai are actually constructing yachts in Europe um, for pleasure. The only problem with that elite group, as I call it for now, is that they do not use their yachts in Asia. They stay in uh, in Europe. They like to explore that, and some of them even go to the extremes of Antarctica and, uh, and, and go further afield. You don't see many of these yachts in Asia. Um, then you have the, the middle group, which is really the, uh, the custom yachts in the 500 GT uh, range. And that's getting very, very popular, and more and more people are interested in that. Uh, and and that also leads, and those yachts are in Asia, and that also leads to charter opportunities, because uh, we haven't got many good charter yachts in Asia, mainly because most people in Asia don't want to charter their yachts. Uh, but I think gradually there is a turning point there, and uh, that particular size of yachts is very suitable for charter. Um, and it's a, an attractive uh, yacht to own. I would call that the middle group. And then the lower group, not lower in, in anything other than what um, Kenneth mentioned, restrictions in marinas, restrictions in, uh, in, in, in driving licenses and all kinds of other restrictions, really is the market from, uh, from, from 60 to 110 foot. And uh, that's very strong. I mean, the, the Ferretis, the Asimots, all these production yards are really selling uh, well into Asia. And, uh, and I think that's a trend that will continue. Uh, that leaves us with a lot of second-hand boats, <coughs> excuse me, that <coughs> with a lot of second-hand boats that are difficult to sell because uh, most Asian, I would say, second-time buyers want new boats. So the second-hand boats are difficult to uh, to sell in this part of the world, and they most of them find a way out to other markets. Australia and New Zealand are a little different, and they're much more um, domestic markets, I would say, than what we see here in Southeast Asia, where it's more integrated. Yeah, yeah. 
Can I just change tack into the topic of China, Kenneth? Uh, what, what are you expecting to come from China in the future? I am seeing still a, um, at least from my perspective, um, there are more Chinese owners of yachts, but I'm not seeing a general growth trend as in a very um, grassroots type of uh, build-up. Yeah. In the States, I think uh, the tradition, or even Europe, is that you know people start small and they grow uh, to a bigger and bigger yacht as they progress in life, as they you know able to accumulate wealth and then move up the ladder. Here, there seems to be the entry point seems to be, you know, anything over fifty foot. Uh, there's not a lot of market where people start small, and uh, I'm not seeing a big change yet. But I think over time, I have to be hopeful. I think more people, as they grow, as uh, as think as uh, age progress, uh, people may behavior may change. I think there'll be younger generation who wanted to operate and start small and then grow into bigger. Uh, I can only say that the, uh, the, it's still sort of a, a field of dreams, kind of a, a script uh, about the Chinese market. The hopeful thing I see is more and more uh, younger Chinese people who made their wealth in the, uh, say, the fund, uh, fund management industry, investment banking industry, technology industry, and so on. Uh, they are they are more interested in getting outdoor, being outdoor than the previous generation. Yeah. They like to install karaoke or mahjong sets inside the yacht, and stay inside. Uh, I'm seeing the younger set. I think in the in the 40s, 50s, who are likely uh, um, educated uh, overseas, uh, left China, educated overseas, came back, um, made their wealth. They're starting to uh, get out more. They are. Uh, um, for example, they would be doing SUP, as Bart said. They would do uh, wick serving. They would actually buy these really expensive ski nautique or Malibu Mastercraft uh, as a uh, speedboat, and they could use that uh, uh, for wick surfing, wick boarding with their children. And they are also uh, picking up these new uh, fun stuff like uh, air foiling, where you stand on a board and the board sort of gets out, you know, halfway up the water and then you're flying on top of the water. I'm seeing a lot of those happening. So I think that that's a, an encouraging sign that I'm seeing. But I, I'm, I would, personally, I would like to see more young Chinese uh, start small uh, and graduate up uh, step by step. I think that is the way to build a strong base for the yachting market long term. And out of interest, do you think they will use the wider Southeast Asia region to cruise, or will it be very domestic? I I have to guess that they would, because I think by nature they're very inquisitive. They like to experience. They like to do th um, different things and enrich their life, especially, especially the younger generation. They like to go out with their drone, their, their um, action camera. They like yeah. to record what they have done and share, um, share the experience with their friends on YouTube or whatever media that they have. So I can only speculate that the younger generation would be more adventurous. They're more willing to go outdoor. They don't mind the sun as much. They would go diving, SUP, wake surfing, just to you know, enrich their overall experience. And, 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 and in that respect, I, I have to guess that, yes, they would uh, venture out a lot more. Than, uh, than their previous generation who prefer to stay indoor. Dominic, have you experienced any Chinese clients yet, or do you expect that to grow? I experienced very little. We had two, in five years, we had two, two Chinese clients. They were very, very happy. Uh, they were very wealthy. They both came with private jet, small number. So like one charter, we were six people. The other charter, we have four people. And you can, we can accommodate 14. So, it was very, um, very, very wealthy people. They love the area. Uh, they did a lot of outside activity. They discover a lot of outside, and they, and they were happy to discover it. So yeah, it's exactly what Kenneth is saying. Uh, the age, I mean, we had uh, 
uh, two couple, one charter was two couple in their 50 and the other were younger. Uh, but yeah, only two, only, <laughs> only two charter in five years. So that's, uh, that's not a lot. And I mean, they're right, they're right in front of us, you know, just about no jet lag, very easy access. Yeah. So I think, I think the question is, is how, how in your, all your experience, do we improve that appetite or improve that engagement? What is the way to, we can get the Chinese to do more Lamima cruises or, or become part of our next generation culture? Because it's, it's, such a ripe audience across the whole yeah. age. It mean, is, it is but already the problem is to communicate with China. You know, we cannot communicate with Google. We cannot, it's, it's, it's another system. So you need to have people inside China to do the promotion of the yacht. You cannot do promotion of your, even at, I think from Hong Kong is not so easy. So you really need to be inland. And uh, it's a very close, I mean, I had no connection for that. Uh, Till now, I don't think company connection is too much connection with that. But for sure, if you had a, a company who could work there, that should have a, that, that should produce a lot of results. Kenneth, any comment? Yes, I think uh, I have to say that uh, I can, again, I have to speculate that uh, the way to get to Chinese clients, especially the very top level of uh, with the top level wealth, it often is by word of mouth. Uh, it's often that uh, the friends gathering around dinner share their experience, what they have done recently, and then it sort of piqued their interest. Uh, and then they would say, oh, really, you've done that? Uh, how did it work? And then so on and so forth. And, and through that way, they, they would, uh, it's, to me, I think it's the most effective way to get them interested. But then mm -hmm. you can't really hire a spokesperson and get into that group to do no. that for you. So um, I have to say that uh, we can only do so by um, as much as possible by approaching the people in that, um, that lifestyle or echelon uh, and see whether we could sort of you know, um, share that experience with them. It's never a, a an easy sale. Uh, getting access uh, mm. by a salesperson, uh, it's not a very Chinese way in terms of uh, approaching them for business. So but, uh, yeah. I have to, right. I'm not ruling out that we don't have the access, but it will just uh, we cannot do a hard sale on them. Mm. So Kenneth, in terms of uh, opening a yacht broker network network in, in China, you don't think it will be worth it? Um. <laughs> I think we have, actually. Uh, but what people forget is that China is, is a huge geographic area with cities with 15 million people and so on. And the um, economic, economic development in China is still somewhat behind what I would call the Western world. Uh, so the educational process is very important. And because we don't have any of your boats going into China, it's very difficult to convince these people that you know something like La Miba is a fun or is a great uh, experience. I think the only way gradually is, and that is what we're trying to do, is to meet people in the, and every industry is an emerging industry in China, like a industry, like a, um, um, uh, con share services, you know, it's all emerging and and so you have to really get into that group of industries and invite them out to La Mima, but you don't give as much time as uh, fam trips, but really we should do fam trips with Chinese uh, travel groups to convince them what the beauty is of these um, these tours and these destinations and unless you can bring the people there who will then sell it to the the clients, it's going to be a very slow process. Uh, and believe me, uh, we, we're trying very hard because we see this enormous market and yet we're not really uh, catching it. Uh, that is the problem. Well, but, but there I'm, all, I'm all open for fun trip if you have the right travel agent from China. You're welcome. <laughs> Good. Well, we'll do that. <laughs> spread the word, spread the word. No, I, th I think what's interesting is, is that what we look at this now is that what we're seeing from the crisis, and I think the lesson we're learning from, from this conversation as well, is that 
the Asian market is getting excited or engaged with yachting on a very regional domestic level because of travel restrictions. And therefore, if people are using their yachts more around the Hong Kong Bay Area, um, and people are starting to think about a bigger boat because of the size. And if you spend time on a boat for two or three days and you start experiencing the size, you know that you might want a bigger boat. It's the typical uh, I say evolution in motion of a, of a yacht buy. So I'm trying to almost look at this. The, the future, Bart, from a buying perspective, we can probably suggest it's looking very healthy. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, I think it looks very healthy, um, and, uh, and and it's good to have these moments of crisis to actually reflect on what we have been doing in the last five years and and the things that we have been doing that weren't successful, and and perhaps be more innovative to uh, to bring um, areas into the picture and to develop markets that haven't been developed yet. And uh, Dominique, I agree with you. Uh, um, China is huge and we should get you far more charters uh, and this is something we have to uh, to work on yeah I, th I think I think also on top of that topic is is that what we have to do you say innovate Bart and we have to think differently of what we've learned in the past we, we've had probably 10 years of people trying to tackle the Asian market and the Chinese market um, it does take time it does take a cultural shift it does take a crisis to almost trigger a new era of a marketplace. So let's suggest that this is a time we have to rethink and refocus that yachting, as we've said before in previous conversations, yachting is the ultimate escape, the most perfectly private destination to be away with your family and is very safe, secure and private. Is that a change in language we need to use for what was typically an asset for business. Yes, I think we have to learn a new language. Number one, I think we have to rejuvenate. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the key people in the industry in Asia, including myself, uh, we all have gray hair and getting on. I think we need to uh, get many more younger people in this industry who are keen. and. This is something that I see happening now. Uh, I've been a long member of the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club and sailing is, is a very keen sport there and uh, sail training is very keen. And if, if I look at the Yacht Club now versus five years ago, I can see in any race, Saturday, Sunday, I can see more than half of the boats uh, skippered and crewed by extremely competent uh, Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese, but also mainland Chinese crews. And so that is the grassroots sailing that we want because these people are all qualified. They are, at the end of the day, qualified instructors, qualified skippers, qualified whatever. And that's what we need to really get this motion going. They can come into the industry. They can be, be brokers. They can be salesperson. They can be uh, um, um, technical people, support people. I think that is what we need because right now we just do not have the manpower to really reach out to this much younger group. Yeah, yeah. Kenneth, any comment? Uh, no, no comment. Okay, I think what's, in, what's interesting from my point of view is, is that where we are today is a topic of conversation that's been happening for many years. I've been coming to Singapore and Hong Kong and uh, parts of the Asian region, even Hainan a couple of years ago, everyone talks about potential. And everyone talks about how much potential there is across the region. There's one question I have that I need to sort of try and address with the three of you is, what are the real barriers that stop this market moving? What are the things that have always been a, something to overcome? I, I know Indonesia's barriers, but I'm trying to, across the region, what are the primary barriers? Is it not just infrastructure? Is it government attitude? Is it legislation what are the things we have to really overcome well if if i can start first i will have oh. to say that uh, the it it is never a secret for people like Bart, who's uh, been in hong kong for so long uh, to realize that uh, there's a major lack of infrastructure meaning that yes they are a little bit uh, uh, more marinas 
but all in all, when you when you see where most of the expensive yachts are being birthed today in the Typhoon Shelter, without proper birthing, no electricity, no water to keep the boat clean, um, accessible only by um, sampan or dinghy, um, it is no way to ke properly keep a you know multi-million dollar vessel. It is just being left there to slowly rot in my opinion so yeah. in that sense it is a very sad uh, that uh, this um, the government um, has never taken a strong initiative to develop the industry not recognizing that it is a an employment generating uh, uh, potential business area where you know the crews skippers uh, repair people shipyards uh, will be employed and and those are opportunities for the young people who prefer working outdoor and prefer to graduate one day maybe onto super yachts in in uh, Europe or the US where they can sort of take uh, international recognized courses RYA you know MCA and so on and get their certification and move up on a different career path the, I think the the government has through all these years completely missed the ball we are always trying to change that but uh, we we have not been uh, given a lot of uh, reception but I think in that sense Bart can probably supplement because I think he's also been trying very hard to lobby the government in the last how many 10 20 years right Bart absolutely can it um, I mean uh most of my gray hair is because I've been lobbying with government here and not getting anywhere. I think that is a, it's something that I've always found peculiar because Hong Kong is such a can-do city and Hong Kong has been so progressive in many areas of business but for some reason yachting is not uh, on the radar and it's very hard to get on the radar and in mainland China a similar effect right it almost is like the marine department who covers yachting is too much focused on commercial shipping and they don't really have the expertise and they're not willing to learn the expertise to run a, uh, a, yachting, uh, a yachting environment. And interestingly enough, I think there's 12,000 licenses for vessels in Hong Kong and over 9,000 are pleasure vessels. So you would think that uh, the government and marine department would actually focus on that and do something with it. But so far, difficult. I have hope because we have a new wave within the marine department and I have hope that it's getting a bit better now. Uh, but that's an issue and that's not only an issue in Hong Kong, it's an issue in Indonesia, it's an issue in, uh, in most countries we are here. It's even an issue in Australia for that matter, even though that's a fantastic water sports culture and a water sports country. Their regulators also um, suffer from uh, vision and, uh, and and looking at it as you say as a uh, an, an industry that employs young people um, that can be an educator that can actually keep people from the streets it can take our youth and and do something sensible with it instead of uh, just watching a, a screen and, uh, and and going out to discotheques i think we can offer more but it has to be seen as part of the uh, the makeup of our culture, and it isn't. An, I'm afraid, not yet. Yeah, we keep fighting. We never give up. Before I bring uh, Dominic, in, just just a quick comment there from Martin uh, for you, Kenneth. Yachting is not the main concern of a communi a communist government. What do you think of that statement? Who are you asking? No, I, I don't. I, I don't think that's relevant. Because the people who can afford yachting have nothing. Well, they don't really. That we they will not change a holiday because the communist party don't like this type of holiday. I don't think so. I think the problem is more like uh, we have we cannot we like me. There is no way I can um, contact any Chinese travel agents. It's a total different system. Yeah. If Bart or Kenneth have connection. That that will be really interesting to develop this connection to develop the, the business there. Yeah, yeah. So so what do you think is the future of Indonesia and yachting then? Um, just to just to, to put yeah. one comment yeah. on that. What are the barriers there? Obviously it's government and uh, regulation. I think 
if they just change one law, which is like, which at the moment, the law ban charter for foreign flag, okay? If they, just, if they just remove that law without spending one rupee, they will attract all the investors. Because Indonesia, uh, not, not like, like bar say in Asia, you can cruise six months in a year. This is true, but not Indonesia. Indonesia, you can, you can, you can cruise uh, the whole year around because it's around the equator, okay? Yes. So one time you're in Flores, the other time you're in Rajampat. So the potential is huge. Huge on 12 months of the year, you can do charter different place every time. So I think if they change that, that law, they will find money to build marina and to build refit center. And that, that could become, because you know, it will be much more simple. Indonesia is a big cruise, cruise ground in the area. This is the biggest cruise ground in the area, the most interesting cruise ground, okay? And it's close to everything. It's close to Australia, it's close to uh, Thailand, it's close to, it's in the center. So it will make sense that Indonesia became the hub of the charter market. It will make sense. So it will make sense to, to, to build the shipyard there, to build the marina there and the refit center. Yeah, I, th I think what's interesting, and there's a comment there from Nicola, who I think is the Nicola in Singapore maybe, that, that does the panel recognize the need for industry-wide collaboration to drive this growth? Now, I think what I've seen and what I think is an interesting subject there is it's a very fragmented sector. Thailand does their thing, Indonesia does their thing, Hong Kong, Vietnam. It's all very independent strategic thinking rather than a very collaborative yachting strategy. Kenneth, do you think that's possible to change? That all the regions start working together like an ASEAN yachting culture? I, I think it, it's the only way to... Uh to uh, make uh, the infrastructure development happen. As we yeah. all know, I think Japan is pretty much a closed market for uh, yachting. Uh, Hong Kong is not developing proper, uh, even uh, facilities for visiting yachts. Uh, I think as uh, you know, uh, the guest mentioned in Indonesia, you know, Thailand can do better with their charter rules uh, so on and so forth. I think it would help a, a lot if the ASEAN uh, get together and and uh, put this on on an agenda, because it's it's all about tourism growth. It encourages people to travel uh, via water, and then and then uh, it can only increase uh, revenue for the government long term. So I I don't see why uh, this cannot be. A, taken up by the uh, by some government initiative or the tourism ministry of uh, each of the countries to promote uh, the uh, the uh, the yachting uh, uh, um, course yeah I think, I think the, the point is that I know Andy Treadwell with the Singapore yacht show team have actually worked very hard on trying to bring people together I know guy from Hong Kong there talks about Hong Kong boating Association Asia Pacific super Yacht Association there's lots of initiatives but surely what we need is people with power, people with, let's say, the right investor level or the right um, financial means to actually change the course of a market. It can't be lots of industry groups chatting to government because it doesn't have the same weight or same influence sometimes. I'm thinking about yourself, Kenneth, and Lyson, or all the other large investor groups who now are in yachting. There needs to be some sort of collaboration at that level rather than lots of industry bodies trying to knock on the door. Um, you, you are right, but uh, I think uh, the, in, the experience has, uh, has told us that uh, um, industry or company level effort is often not enough. Uh, there has to be strong support from either a, a government bureau, uh, the tourism bureau, for example, or the tourism uh, uh, commission to take the course forward. Sort of drive it forward because without any um, government level support, it is it has proven to be a very difficult proposition for industry uh, people uh, to push the cost forward. So I think that has to change but the mentality your, of the government. In your experience over the, the several years in the investment world, the property world, collaboration between Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, Hong Kong, has that happened on a business level you've ever experienced? 
Well, the, the interest of uh, developing marina uh, properties has always been strong, I think, in the real estate development uh, uh, industry. Especially, uh, it often enhances the value of the uh, residential or commercial development that is uh, surrounding uh, uh, a marina. I think uh, Singapore has proven to be a very successful uh, development uh, case study. Uh, yeah. As we have uh, uh, been to the Singapore York Show, uh, we all understand what value the uh, development could bring, not only to the city, but to the community and to the tourism business. So if uh, Hong Kong has the same foresight uh, as uh, Singapore does and uh, open up the market, I think uh, the potential uh, can be great. I think it's similar for Thailand, Indonesia, Japan, uh, and any you know Vietnam and and anywhere you know in Southeast Asia. Uh, all of these places have great potential to be uh, developed into a great charter and cruising grounds. Uh, all it has to do is for the government to to uh, put this agenda further ahead in their development plans. Yeah, and I think I think the crisis may actually be more of a catalyst for this change and this strategic conversation. So I think it's a very interesting, I say, endpoint on this webinar to sort of say, okay, next step should be, uh, I say, a collaborative roundtable uh, that could be driven by Camper Nicholson's uh, as a starting point with the various associations coming to the table. So uh, listen. Uh, I, I hope that uh, that has been an interesting conversation. I hope you've enjoyed being part of the webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Um, and um, any more questions or comments from anyone before we close? I, I do. I, I saw in the comment section someone was wondering what happened to uh, the Jumbo restaurant behind, <laughs> behind us. Uh, I'm sorry to report that uh, because of COVID, uh, it suffered uh, in terms of business and it has closed down unfortunately so uh, I'm afraid that we may not see it in in uh, in the uh, beautiful Aberdeen uh, typhoon shelter any longer after this uh, in you know this event so uh, it's really sad uh, for all of us who grew up with a jumbo restaurant being in a feature in Aberdeen typhoon shelter but uh, for one of the viewer who asked this question, uh, uh, I'm sorry to report that uh, it probably won't be there uh, the next time you visit Hong Kong. Unless it's a license opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a Nicholson so, opportunity, maybe we can sell her. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and uh, see you on the other side. Stay safe. Thank you, Martin. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.